Suzanne Stabile is a longtime United Methodist, wife of a United Methodist pastor, best-selling author, and known internationally as the Enneagram Master. On today's episode of Get Your Spirit in Shape, Suzanne shares how she uses the Enneagram to feel closer to God, teaches us how Enneagram wisdom can be a tool to achieve balance and wholeness in our lives, and how she believes John Wesley's Enneagram number influenced his founding of Methodism. Suzanne, welcome to Get Your Spirit in Shape. Thank you. I I got up this morning and thought, is my spirit in shape? Like, I need to be sure I'm ready. (laughs) Well, I'm sure it is, and uh, we're going to talk about that, too. In fact, there is no way we're going to cover all the questions that I have. I just have page after page of questions, but we're going to try to get to, to a lot of them. And before we talk about your new book, which is titled The Journey to Wholeness, Enneagram Wisdom for Stress, Balance, and Transformation, can you tell us just a little bit about yourself, please? Sure. I am 71. I've been teaching the Enneagram for about 30 years, teaching and learning. I learned from Richard Rohr a long time ago. Um, We have four children. We sent them all the way to school. They all came back. And they all live here with their spouses, and we have nine grandchildren. My husband, Joe, is a United Methodist pastor, but he was a Roman Catholic priest until he was 40. And so he's been, he's 74. So we've been in the United Methodist Church for 34 years. He is currently on staff at First United Methodist downtown Dallas as a retired clergy person. He, as you know, in the Methodist Church, they have to retire at 72 and he just didn't want to, and had an opportunity to continue to be on staff. And so he still gets to do all the things he loves, and we do Life in the Trinity ministry together. We founded it in the Catholic Church, actually, 37 years ago. And when Joe left the priesthood, brought it, he brought it with him or with us. And we do a lot of work out of that, which is our own nonprofit. And you are an author and you're a podcast host. But when I was looking at your bio, the um, one thing I just loved, it says that you are an Enneagram master. That just sounds like a superhero title to me. Mm-hmm. I love that. And uh, so we're going to talk about the Enneagram. We're going to talk about your new book. And I'm sure we have listeners who might be familiar with the word, those who are extremely familiar with Enneagram, and then those who maybe for the first time are hearing this word. Um, you're probably asked a lot, uh, this asked this question a lot, but can you just give us a really, like maybe the elevator pitch for what is Enneagram? Sure. Um, I, I've been trying to have an elevator speech for a long time, and it's very difficult. The Enneagram doesn't lend itself to that. So let me just give you some highlights that would, of course, be followed with lots more information if we had time. When I first heard about the Enneagram, Richard Rohr was our mentor, Joe's and mine, and our spiritual director. And I found out how much I appreciated it almost immediately. And he suggested that I study for five years before I talked about it. And so I did that. And I think that has made the difference in how I see and apply and understand the Enneagram because I didn't, I I didn't ever take a shortcut along the way because I had accountability to do it differently than that. So the Enneagram is, I believe, uh, 3,000 plus years old, and it has roots in all faith beliefs all over the globe. And it is essentially nine ways of seeing. But, you know, there's deep Enneagram wisdom and there's trendy Enneagram. And the Enneagram is very trendy right now, and I'm glad it is. That's a good thing. Everything has two sides. And one of the temptations is to think that you can type other people and you can't because your Enneagram number is determined by your motivation for behavior and not for behavior. And all this talk around taking a a little quiz and then knowing your Enneagram number and your wings and your subtype, that's not, that's just not accurate. And I hope it leads people to what is accurate because in my experience, the Enneagram, if used properly, has the potential to be life-changing or transformative, I would say. I get a lot of email and a lot of people in conferences or places where I'm speaking 
And they tell me that knowing the Enneagram literally changed their life in one way or another with their children, with their spouse, with their parents, with their job, with how they decided to leave that and do something else. It It is really a, a very powerful wisdom offering. However, it's just one. I think it's real. Well, I just think it's really important. People have been asking me uh, on interviews for publication for a long time, what's dangerous about the Enneagram? And I only have one thing to say that's dangerous, and that is that you take it to be more than it is. And it's pretty great, but it's one singular thing. When I was first discovering that I and still discovering that I am a, a two wing three, it seems, a close friend sent me a description and I read it and I cried. And I cried because I was reading things about myself that I hadn't even realized maybe were truths about my motivations. And it felt vulnerable, but it also felt really important that I was, you know, recognizing this for the first time, which has started this exploration into my motives and my weaknesses. And the more I explore, the more I have to learn, I also realize. But Susan, how does this kind of self-awareness, how does that impact my ability to love God, to love other people, to love myself? Um, Let's start with God first. When Joe, my husband Joe, joined the Vincentian community, he was 14. He went away to high school seminary, and he's 74. He's had a spiritual director for 60 years. And he is a spiritual director. And the the reality of that relationship is to bring your real self and have somebody represent your belovedness from God and then to know who you are in relationship to God. And if you show up in relationship with God in whatever ways you do that, with your personality, which is your Enneagram number, instead of your essence, which is who you are underneath all of this behavior, and all of the reasons for that behavior, then you've reached the place where you can actually embrace, see, be aware of opportunities to do life in a more holistic and better way. In relationship to ourselves, it's it's very difficult, and you were just talking about it, it's very difficult to address what you can't name. People go through life saying, you know, I wish this was a little different, or I wish this was different, but they don't know what to do with that. And I think one of the reasons people sometimes cry and sometimes walk away from the Enneagram and sometimes get excited when they hear their number is because it rings true, but those are things you hadn't yet been able to put words to for yourself. And I also believe you can't change what you can't name. So if you can have a greater awareness about who you are, about how you are in relationship with other people, about who you are in relationship with God, then the path before you is one that is less fraught with options that maybe are not choosing your best option and that are filled with misunderstanding of other people. Mm -hmm. My daughter's an eight on the Enneagram. She's 44, but my oldest daughter. And she's known the Enneagram since she was 18. And she called me one day, I don't know, maybe early 30s, mid-30s, maybe early mid-30s, and called me one morning early and she said, Mom, I, I'm pretty sure the golden rule doesn't apply to eights. To which I said, well, that's a fascinating statement. It's something an eight would say. So how how is it that it doesn't apply to you? And she said, I treat people exactly like I want to be treated, and it doesn't go well. And so I think what we have to come away with is there are nine ways, with all the variations of those nine ways, of how people want to be treated. And if you can begin to know enough about other people to treat them the way they want to be treated instead of the way you want to be treated, and to recognize that standing from exactly the same point you have different points of view, then that automatically uh, eliminates some of the problems, not all, that accompany relationships. Suzanne, I've read or heard that the nine enneotypes 
each represent a characteristic of God. I tried to research it a little deeper to kind of, yeah. like, you know, and I, I couldn't really find a lot about that. But I think the the gist of it was that, you know, with the, each of us made in God's image, that at our best, we're reflecting that part of, you know, God to the world. Have you heard that or has how has that played into the Enneagram Enneotypes? Well, the language I use is that the Enneagram represents the face of God. So that's a, a, a much more inclusive reality. Joe and I are doing a good bit of work with pastors right now because the church is in, some days I think the church is in such danger. Some days I think the church is in the middle of such loss or, or other days it's such potential and such hope. But one of the things I'm very mindful of is in those churches where people are making decisions for other people, which we do a lot in the United Methodist Church. Unless all nine ways of seeing are represented at the table, then there exists a group of people who are not represented in the conversation. And I do believe that the Enneagram is the face of God if you look at the whole thing and take the whole thing together. If you look at the Gospels, if you know a good bit about the Enneagram and you read Luke, then you will pick out messages that are just for you. So since you're a two and I'm a two, I'll give you an example. Uh, this isn't the most loving thing I could do for you. I'm sorry, but it helps us teach. But, you know, one of the things that we might think about, one of the gospel stories is um, go out and round up all the people and bring them to the table. And be sure that you choose people who can't pay you back. I would love it as twos, if we could say, oh, we, we don't want people to pay us back. But the reality is that most of the time we expect to get something in return. It's not dinner. It's appreciation, which isn't what we're looking for either. We're looking for love. We settle for appreciation. But we want there to be some awareness of the thing that we did to be in relationship with the people that we bring in for the meal, right? Another example is Martha. You know, she's, Martha and Mary and Lazarus are together, Lazarus sisters, and Jesus is coming to dinner. And Mary is having a conversation with Jesus in the family room. I hope the theologians will be, you know, just take a deep breath. I'm not a theologian. And they're talking, which Martha really wants to be part of, but she's also cooking dinner and in the kitchen and preparing to serve, right? And that's often where we find ourselves. We're often trying to prepare to serve someone when we want, want relationship instead. So that's a way I think we know that. And whatever your Enneagram number is, it's in there. Joe is a lectionary preacher. And of course, the churches we've served have primarily been Enneagram wise because of my work. And they know when they walk out of worship on a Sunday, if that gospel story was really just for their Enneagram number. Well, you're right. I um, Now that I've, as I've been studying Enneagram, I'm so aware of my motivations and often embarrassed yeah. by my motivation. Yeah. Which is okay, as long as it's not shame. Yeah. So let's talk about the book. This is your third book mm -hmm. um, about Enneagram. And the title is The Journey to Wholeness, which feels like a, a really tall order to uh, find this, this place where we learn to balance our stress in a way for transformation. In the book, you write that the book started out at a time where, that you felt was tumultuous. There were lots of changes in the world, a lot of anger in the world, a lot of anxiety. And it was interesting that all of this was pre-pandemic. Mm -hmm. So... How has the pandemic changed the book or changed your teaching of the book? Because I'm sure that just the pandemic just exacerbated all of that. Yeah. Talk about liminality has been around maybe for three years, kind of, or four. I, I have lost track of time because of the pandemic. But prior to that, people weren't talking about liminality or writing about it. And I began to feel like before the pandemic that there was anger and anxiety falling on all of us, unbidden. It's, it was just everywhere. 
And I started to question why that was true. And I began to think about all of the ways that I believed that we were in liminal space. And um, for listeners who don't know about liminality, it is essentially when you're betwixt in between. It's when you're on the threshold. It's when you're not where you were and not where you're going. In our denomination as United Methodist, a good example of liminal space is when you know you're going to be moved, but you haven't moved yet. And for churches, it's you know your pastor's leaving, but you don't know who's coming yet. Uh, Undocumented workers are in liminal space. Pregnant women are in liminal space. Kids who have graduated from high school but haven't left for college are in liminal space. It's everywhere. And so when I was looking at that, I thought, you know, I I think the Enneagram has a lot to say about that. So I wonder if it would be important in my teaching for me to address liminality before I began to talk about some very specific things for each number that I think might be helpful on the journey toward transformation, since that's not a destination. It's just always a journey. And so I actually sold the idea for the book to InterVarsity Press before the pandemic. And then when the pandemic started, I thought, oh man, I missed it. And then I realized, no, I actually now can speak to a space that everyone has experienced in one way or another. I did part of the writing during the pandemic, but it didn't really change what I had planned to write and to say. You know, I wasn't familiar with that term, liminal space, until I read your book. And honestly, I thought it probably was coined because of the pandemic. (laughs) Um, But, you know, as you're saying, there have been times in all of our lives where we find ourselves in in the between. Yeah. So, well, and so those way to successfully survive these liminal times, you write, is to find the balance and learn to manage the stress and the relationships and the unknowns. So how do we begin that process? Well, first of all, let me say that when I started writing about liminality, I knew that Father Richard Rohr had talked to Joe and me about that. So I started looking back through my journals and he started telling us about liminal space 19 years ago. And he said then, and still says, liminal space is the most teachable space. And then he went on to say, In fact, it may be the only teachable space. And if you look in Scripture, you will find that God is always trying to push us into liminality. So I think we want to know that this discomfort has lots of potential. The Enneagram actually holds space for lots of groupings of three. There are three triads that are based on three centers of intelligence, which are based on the work of Maurice Nicole, which was introduced kind of along with some modern Enneagram work in the 1940s. And essentially, a man named Gurdjieff revived the Enneagram, and he was had a school in Europe. Maurice Nicole came along. He was in England, and he said, you know, we, we actually all respond to all stimulus first with either what do I think, what do I feel, or what am I going to do? And if you put that reality and the work of Maurice Nicole on the Enneagram, then what you have is twos, threes, and fours respond first with what do I feel, five, sixes, and sevens with what do I think, and eights, nines, and ones with what am I going to do? Let me go ahead and set the table, and then I'll come back. Stances also were talked about first during that time. And there was a woman who was doing a lot of really good work with psychology and understanding motivations and how we relate to people. And her name is Karen Horneye. And she was German-American. And if you put Karen Horneye's work with Maurice Nicole's work on top of the Enneagram, and Karen Horneye said, we all either move toward other people, away from other people, or we stand against other people. Karen Horney's work on top of Maurice Nichols, on top of the Enneagram, shows you that one number in each of the three triads moves toward other people. One moves away from people, and the other, in her language, stands against people. 
I'm no longer using that language of standing against other people. I think there's a better way to say that. And I believe that three sevens and eights, who are those three numbers in that stance, stand independently. And it feels to us like they stand against us. So if we go back to your question, then we have the Enneagram and then we have these three triads. And your triads determined by your dominant center. If you can't manage your dominant center, you cannot achieve balance with all three centers. So I have to manage feeling in order to appropriately use thinking, feeling, and doing for each, each for its intended purpose. If you can't balance that, then doing stance work is very challenging. And I believe stance work is the magic of the Enneagram. If there's magic anywhere, I think that's where it is. And essentially in stance work, you don't try to push down your dominant center, which you've learned about in terms of triads. You try to bring up the center that you use the least well, which is referred to as your repressed center. So my way of being in the world as a two is that I am feeling dominant, doing supports feeling meaning. I take in feelings from the world and my first response is, what am I going to do about that? But my problem is I don't use thinking to make that decision because thinking is my least used or repressed center of intelligence. And so on this journey, if you can't be working on balancing the three centers, then your response to life will lack balance as well. And so the book walks one through understanding liminal space and then starting with triads, you got to do this work. Then with stances, you have to do this work. And then you still have the problem of stress. And the old, fairly traditional Enneagram understanding is that you are connected by a line to the number that you go to in stress and the number that you go to in security. And my teaching about that is that you cannot take care of yourself without the number you go to in stress. And you can't experience holistic healing or what we're talking about is transformation without the number that you go to in security. And the reality is that in our Enneagram number all the time, we're either healthy, average, unhealthy, in excess in our number or sometimes pathological. That means that when you make a move that is either intentional or intuitive, an intuitive move to your stress number, everybody thought meant that you have to go to the unhealthy side of your stress number because that would be equal to being unhealthy in your number and the reason that you're stressed. And the reality is that with some work, not a ton of work, but with some work, you can learn when you feel stressed to access the behavior of the high side of the number you go to in stress. And that has the potential to make all the difference. And I worked in the book to teach people how to choose that and what it looks for their number and for their whole journey through Enneagram wisdom between liminality and transformative opportunities. Suzanne, you might appreciate that for a long time, I've had a post-it on my desk that says, Crystal, stay in your lane. Because as a two, that's a struggle for me. <laughs> sure, sure. And uh, so I, I I do appreciate that the book was so clear in helping me understand where, what I might be doing, you know, instinctively sure. and how to manage that and how to get better at it for that yeah. balanced place. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, just for everybody, since we're both twos, I'm, I'm just going to run through all nine numbers, what it looks like if you're not staying in your lane. Ones who aren't staying in their lane are applying their sense of right and wrong and good and bad to other people and to their behavior in the way they do things. Twos who are not in their lane are helping people who don't want their help and who don't need their help and who didn't ask for their help. And in order to do that, they're not doing the things that are theirs to do. Threes in order to stay in their lane have to avoid expecting other people to take shortcuts And they have to be very careful about keeping their goals short-term and long-term as their goals and not assuming that they can apply those goals to the groups that they belong to. Fours who don't stay in their lane 
are often not what I would call right-sized for the room. And what that means is they are often uh, operating on a deeper level emotionally and intellectually than other people are ready to operate on and in expecting that from other people, they tend to not be in their own lane. Fives, on the other hand, don't inhabit their lane by not keeping up. They uh, are fine to park in their lane. And when a five parks, that means that they think about doing, but they're not doing. And they think about engaging, but they're not engaging. And so fives have to stay in their lane by doing what is theirs to do and making it possible for everybody else to move forward in the lanes that they're in. Sixes struggle a lot with fear, which is better named as anxiety for them. And when you, as a six, kind of sprinkle your anxiety on what everybody else is doing, then it holds you back and it tends to be a block for other people. Sevens go too fast in their lane to avoid maybe uh, some of the other folks who are traveling along beside them. And they reframe things very quickly that need to be looked at that might be painful. Eights uh, are natural born leaders and they always want to lead. And they really kind of like for people to line up behind them in the lane that they're in while they lead us to get some things done. And nines in relationship to lanes have a tendency to stay in their lane, but they don't occupy the lane that is theirs in terms of responsibility and participation. Thank you. I think that that's going to help our listeners really kind of think about themselves and maybe see themselves in there. And as they learn more, that's really helpful information. One of the lines that really stuck out to me in the book, Suzanne, it says, it is always your option to connect with your soul in ways that enlarge rather than diminish the goodness of who you are. I read that and it felt so hopeful. It felt so empowering that it was an option for me to choose and I really love that hopefulness. Can you talk about this process of soul connection and how we use the Enneagram to, to do that, to make that connection, to enlarge um, the goodness of who we are? Sure. Well, well, you have to start with the fact that I spend my life and my days teaching people who they're not. So your Enneagram personality is necessary, and it's how all of us made our way out of childhood kind of into life, right? But it's not who you are. Who you are is underneath all of that. And the trick with getting back to essential, to who you essentially are in your soul, is part of life's journey toward transformation, which is you have to allow parts of your personality to fall away. The trick is we don't do well with allowing, particularly those of us who live in the West. We believe we have to make things happen. and We have to do things that make things happen. And what we're called to do is get up every day, I believe, and find our place in what God's already doing. And that is a place where your soul is called and safe, but you have to allow your personality to fall away in order to inhabit your own soul in that way. And so that's why I think Enneagram work is soul work, because it helps you Recognize that what you needed personality-wise when you were 5 or 15 or 25, you don't necessarily need 40. And if you allow that to fall away, there is a, a way that you inhabit your soul that you didn't know you were invited to because it was covered up with personality. I grew up in the United Methodist Church. I was Catholic for 10 years, which I'm very thankful for. It was a great experience. And then back in the Methodist Church. And I, I, I didn't grow up knowing that my soul was work for me to do. I thought I could mess it up, but I didn't think there was soul work that I could do that would enlarge my capacity for doing life well and comfortably and peacefully. And along with other spiritual practices, again, I, I can't say that enough. I think the Enneagram really helps us to do that. And I think that's where the hope is. The hope is that underneath all of this, we are who we were created to be in the image of God and that we have the potential, as we've been taught, to do 
all that Jesus did and with the help of the Holy Spirit and more besides. And you can't do that, I don't think, from a place of personality. You have to be able to access your soul. And I I just don't think we talk about that very much. And I think it's because we have the question you have, which is, okay, I'd like to do that, but how? I I would like to just say, and people are going to push back on this, and I, okay, I'd like, go ahead, (laughs) but I'm right. (laughs) If we want to do this work, we have to have a contemplative practice. There has to be a a way of listening and of emptying in order to make space for the kind of work that I'm talking about. And there are a lot of spiritual practices and spiritual disciplines that people can add to Enneagram work. But the one underlying practice that Joe and I stand firm on is you've got to have a contemplative practice. And Susan, I love that in your book you identify per any a type what spiritual practice might be most um maybe that that type is most in tune with that spiritual practice i really appreciated that because there there are a lot of practices out there and it might be hard to know well what's going to work you know what am i going to connect with so i appreciated that you i didn't have to try out a lot of things you were saying here here are three you know you can try these just try these and you know Based on talking about triads and stances, it's great to choose one based on the fact that you are feeling dominant. But you also need to include one that is based on the fact that you are thinking repressed. That helps you bring up thinking because that's part of achieving the balance that we're looking for, right? Right. And I, we, I think we're inclined toward one that really suits our personality, which is great. But that's like the appetizer, and then you need something that stretches you, too. Sure. That's something that's going to help you grow. Right. Yeah. So how would you say um, that the Enneagram and Enneagram wisdom has impacted your personal relationship with God? Different ways at different times, I would say. I, I have always believed that God is all benevolent and all loving. I work with a lot of people who grew up or who have as adults experienced the opposite of that and who come from a frame of reference that they're in trouble and that there's work they have to do or they're going to be forever in trouble. And I think what the Enneagram reveals, it has for me, is that I, I am God's beloved as I am, and I can be more and more aware that I'm God's beloved, the less personality I have. And so because I've been doing this work for a very long time, and I've had a spiritual director for a long time, and I live with Joe Stabile, who I think is the best human on the planet, then I, I have boundaries in the form of people who keep me from believing that I'm not worthy, that I'm not wanted, or that because of ABC, I'm not in the realm of God's beloved. And I think when you get to name the things that you do that are disappointing for you, and then you recognize that they're part of how you see the world and that you're put together that way, then somehow you know there's value there. You just have to find it. So I guess I would say this. I live in the belief that everybody is going to be invited to the table for all eternity and that I have this opportunity to talk about the fact that because we're all at the same table, it doesn't mean that we all see the same way. And in understanding that, we might be able to make room for more and more growth and more and more peace and less fear, I think. I love that. Um, Susan, I have two more questions. One's very Methodist. I loved when I was reading the book that you bring up John Wesley. 
Mm-hmm. And in the book, you speculate that John Wesley may have been in the gut triad or an eight, nine, or a one. Can you talk about how you believe he may have found wholeness or how his ministry was impacted by by his Enneagram number? Sure. I actually kind of gave myself a little breathing room there for people who read the book. I, I actually think he was a one on the Enneagram. <clears throat> And that's a great question because it's a great way for us to look at how the Enneagram finds you where you are and helps helps you build on that so that you can offer something for the greater good. And with Wesley's understanding, I, based on how he lived his life, was that a one would say, there's got to be a method to all of this. We need a plan and there's got to be one. But people won't stick with the method unless we put them in groups so that somebody's checking on or at least privileged to whether or not you're honoring your commitment to the method. And he didn't use anagram language everywhere, but the method, the Sunday school, the way that we methodically work through what is ours to do demands and insists on allowing personality to fall away. But it's kind of a thing that's happening in the background because you're focused on any of these practices that are Wesleyan. I taught Sunday school for 35 years. I'm not going to do that anymore. I teach from time to time, but I, I think I've done what was mine to do. But I've always looked around the Sunday school class from time to time and thought, what would you do if I called you this week? as Wesley instructed, and ask you, how's your soul? And I actually, when I knew that most of the people in the room had done some Enneagram work with me over time, I started asking in Sunday school. So I don't need you to answer publicly, but just for your own edification, how's your soul today? And I think Wesley was contributing for the common good a path that helps us grow our souls. And I think as a one, he did that with lots of dualistic choices because that's how ones see, right? There's a right way and a wrong way, a good way and a bad way. And here's the path we should be on. I'm working with uh, district superintendents from the jurisdiction that I'm in, and I have been for five years, I guess, teaching the Enneagram. And we're beginning to really get someplace, by my estimation, in that group. And one of the reasons is because not only do our pastors have an Enneagram number, but so do our churches. And I didn't talk about this in relationship to stances, but stances each represent an orientation to time. So threes, sevens, and eights, orientation to time is the future. Ones, twos, and sixes, orientation to time is the present moment. And fours, fives, and nines, orientation to time is the past. And what is being looked at by these district superintendents and evaluated and worked with is we can't appoint a pastor whose orientation to time is the future to a church whose orientation to time is the past without a bridge in between and some role that is significant or an interim pastor that is oriented to the present moment to bring people who are oriented to the past to the present before we offer somebody whose vision is for the future. And in our appointive system, the Enneagram has unending potential for how to work with problems that occur because we weren't able to use that metric as part of what they use to decide about appointments. In helping somebody just recognize you're going to have to slow down. Or if you reverse it and the church's orientation to time is the future and the pastor's orientation to time is the past, you're going to have to get with it because they have ideas of moving forward and you can't lead them unless you can catch them. Like I think there's some real important things we could be using in the Methodist church. And right now we need all the tools we can get. Sure. (laughs) Of course. And that's such important insight. And, um, is kind of like, well, yes, of course that makes sense. But without that knowledge and without those tools, we would never maybe have those observations. 
No, I was teaching our bishop in his cabinet, and they all were very confused on their own. It had nothing to do with me about an appointment they made of a very successful pastor to a significant church in our conference, and it didn't work. It just didn't work, and they were all sitting around the table, and I started talking about you can't put a pastor whose orientation of time is the future in a church whose orientation of time is the past, and they literally all looked at each other and said, that's it. That's what we missed. That's what we needed to know. We didn't have that on board. So I, I'm very hopeful, very, very hopeful about that. Well, that Enneagram wisdom is really just opening doors, yeah. isn't it? To yeah. yeah, it sure can. Suzanne, how do you keep your own spirit in shape so that you can ask yourself that question, how is my soul today, and, and get that affirmative answer? Um, I do a contemplative sit every day. And when I'm traveling and I have an early flight and I don't do it, or when I you know, when something goes wrong on a trip, whatever. When I don't do it, by about three o'clock in the afternoon, I'm behaving badly. It's a given. So there's that. Um, And that's been true for me for 35 years, I guess. Now, how do I do a sit every morning? I live with somebody who does a sit every morning. I have lots of accountability built into my life and around me. I'm working always on bringing up thinking because that's repressed for me and that is problematic for my spiritual journey. So uh, right now, I foolishly looked yesterday at the two areas that I'm considering doing Enneagram work, one for sure already and another that I'm considering. A Methodist pastor, Dr. Andy Stoker and I, are going to teach an Enneagram cohort in 23 that is Enneagram and Family Systems, and he's a Family system scholar. So I have a lot to catch up on to be ready for that work with him by January. And so I have pages and pages and pages to read of nonfiction and non-memoir and not stories and things that I don't love, which brings up thinking, and that then is part of my spiritual practice because I have to be balanced in my approach, right? I'm also considering, but haven't committed to, doing work with Enneagram and some folks whose specialty is moral injury. Mm. And that's a learning curve for me. So that's part of my spiritual practice as well. Joe and I were going on, we go on retreat every year and we have some pastor or priest plan the retreat for us, but we go alone. And um, it's often Father Roar in our history, but it's been a lot of people. And we were headed to Arkansas 10 years ago. Our kids were in school, maybe 15. And we had been teaching uh, the world's religions together. And I said, have you thought about the fact that every faith belief has beads except us? Like we need some prayer beads in the Protestant church. So later on in the trip, I said, who planned our uh, retreat? And he said, I did. And I said, oh, okay, well, what, are we, what, what is it? And he said, silent, we're going to do a silent retreat. To which I said, no, 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 no. And we did three and a half days. He won. But during that time, because of that conversation, which is how I think the Holy Spirit works, Joe, having used a rosary for until he was 40 and beyond, created prayers for beads based on the fruits of the Spirit. And in Life in the Trinity Ministry, we have a, an old friend of Joe's, high school seminary friend, who used to make rosaries, who makes our prayer beads. And praying the beads is very helpful to me when I'm anxious because prayer beads require that you do something with your hands, with your mouth, and with your brain. You got to think talk, and do. And they're very helpful to me during times of anxiety. And when I pray them every day during, I don't do them year round, but when I pray them every day during those times, then I carry them in my pocket. And when I start to feel like, oh, I can't get all this done, or I'm feeling anxious, I can put my hand in my pocket and just start praying through the beads and know that. Sometimes I do a daily scripture study and sometimes I don't. Sometimes I do a weekly scripture study and I just uh, have a journal where I work with whatever 
whoever's preaching at our church chooses for the gospel reading for that Sunday. I have a variety of things that stretch me and a variety of things that comfort me. The Liturgy of the Hours is, is one of Joe's spiritual practices for all of time, and he really likes that, so I commit to do that with him part of every year. He does the full liturgy where he prays six times a day when he does that, when that's one of his choices. And I do the Phyllis Tickle representation, which is not quite that heavy. So uh, those are some. The, the most life-giving thing I do is spend time with Joe. And the most life-giving thing we do is spend time with our children and grandchildren. So we try to make that part of all the things. There are 19 of us, but we get together at least once a month. And that's part of my spiritual journey. Thank you for sharing that. And I love that you are, you're not just looking for a spiritual discipline that comforts you, but one that's also growing you and that kind of that always that transformational place of being balanced. There's one that comforts me that I didn't mention that might be a good one to mention. And that is that, I don't know if people know, Henry Nowen is a self-identified too on the Enneagram. And I have chosen to read everything he wrote, which is a lot, lots and lots and lots, because it's been very comforting for me to read somebody else's journey. It highlights the stuff that I still need to work on, but it comforts me that somebody else struggled in the same way that I did. And there are authors for every number that they could read that is going to be challenging, comforting at the same time, but mostly comforting because it's somebody else who is writing about the same experience you're having on your journey. Well, I just can't thank you enough for being with us today on Get Your Spirit in Shape. We'll, of course, link to your website where you can find the book, your podcast, and just where we can learn more about the work that you're doing. It sounds like some exciting work is coming for you as well. And uh, just appreciate just the gift that you are to, to the denomination, to just people all around the world. So thank you so much, Suzanne, for being with us today. Thank you for having me. That was Suzanne Stabile, author of The Journey Toward Wholeness, Enneagram Wisdom for Stress, Balance, and Transformation. To learn more about Suzanne, her new book, and her ministry teaching about the Enneagram, go to umc.org slash podcast and look for this episode. In addition to the helpful links and a transcript of our conversation, you'll find my email address so you can talk with me about Get Your Spirit in Shape. Thank you so much for joining us for today's episode of Get Your Spirit in Shape. I look forward to the next time that we're together. I'm Crystal Cavanis.